You've been hacked. Yeah, that's right. This week we're looking at phishing attacks. Now, what is a phishing attack? We're going to get into in a second. But 90% of hacking is done by phishing, apparently, in this day and age. That's not truth of all time. But at the minute, 90% of attacks come from a phishing attack. I've also read some more statistics that 91% of companies in the UK last year were compromised by a phishing attack. And apparently, during 2021, during the pandemic, phishing attacks went up by 220%. So it's quite vital that we now start to understand what phishing is. So in this, we're going to look at what phishing is and the general type of scamming attacks that are a bit like phishing. Then we're going to move on how to spot it, debunk whether it's a genuine contact or whether it's phishing. Then we're going to look at what to do if you've been caught in a phishing attack. And then we're going to look at some examples. So let's get on with it. So a phishing attack can come from anywhere. It can be an email, it can be a text, it can even be a letter. It can be a Telegram message, it can be a WhatsApp message, it can be a Discord message. It can be anything. Even there's been extent of people using Google Calendar. Insert a link there, people click on it, all goes a bit tits up. Now, why is it so successful? Well, first of all, it's really hard to catch. For example, email phishing attacks. It can be really hard. Obviously, there's privacy concerns with reading people's emails anyway. It can be hard to know what's a malicious link. It can be hard to know what's a malicious email. The links can constantly change. The emails can constantly change. And for example, if you hack into a website, you don't even have to hack into a website. If you find a vulnerable website, you can send thousands of emails through that domain. So instead of example at maliciouswebsite.com, we've now got at Google or at BT Internet, whatever. It can, it's really hard to detect for the things that used, we use protectors like malware and firewalls, so, and spam filters. So that's another reason it's really hard to detect, really hard to stop. But the biggest reason why these are so successful is they are experts in psychology. The social engineering goes on. And you'll see this in the examples we get to later. They really do cause urgency, they cause fear, they cause panic, and they get you to act as quick as possible. Now, when we're fearful, when we're acting in urgency, we don't quite think about what we're doing. We just, oh, we need to get it sorted. So if, if you feel like you're under threat, or if you feel that you've done something wrong uh, and the government are coming after you, you feel that you need to correct it straight away. So that's what they pry on. That's how they get you. And they usually use bits of information that they've found about you, but quite often they haven't actually looked for information about you. They don't even know who you are. They've just got a bit of information out of a database that's been leaked in the past and used that. So for example, they might say, yeah, we even know your password to this. They might know your password to that, but they might also not know your name. So it is quite important to spot this stuff and find out what's being, what's trying to con you, what's trying to trick you, and what is genuine. So let's get on to spotting what's real and what's not. Now, the very first thing you're supposed to do when you get an email and you're not quite sure where it's from, look at the email itself. Yes, that's right, look at the email address. Now, I've got one up here. I'm not quite sure at this point which email is showing, but quite often they'll come up and the name. When you sign up for an email, it'll ask for your name and it'll ask for your email. Now, the name, if you put in companieshouse.gov.uk, That'll come up as the name, so it'll look like that's where it's from. But if you look at the email, the email might be spambot at gmail.com. So it's quite important that we look find the actual from email. And they're usually in these arrow type brackets that we're looking at right now. And there's many different ways to find this depending on your email provider. But usually if you click on the name, it'll open it up. It might open a dialog box where we've got the name and the email. If you click on the little circle icon, I think Outlook has, and most others like Gmail and things, click on that, it'll open up information about where it's from. And another good indicator right there is it could be, could be CC to a thousand people. Now, if BT is trying to contact you because you owe them some money, they're not going to CC that email to thousands of people of it. And it's also important while you're looking at this to make sure it's right. For example, gov, G -O -V and gov, G -Zero -V, UK are two different emails, uh, domains, so therefore we have two completely different email addresses. Obviously, gov.uk is the correct one, g0v 
is not. So that G0V is designed to trick you. It's designed at a glance to look right. So you really do have to look very closely. If it is where it says it's from, you have to look very closely to make sure it is what it says it's from. Because they might have done something very clever like change the D for a B. And your brain don't work that right. Your brain sees it and goes, yeah, that's right. And it corrects any errors. So you do have to go through letter by letter to make sure it's right. The next part is look for typos. Uh, I don't know if we'll get any examples of this at the end, but look for typos and things. A big company is not going to make spelling mistakes and punctuation mistakes it's not going to happen so if it don't read quite right if the grammar's not quite right if there's no punctuation in there if the words aren't in the right place or if there's massive spelling mistakes that's a sign that it's not a big company sending you this email it's some bodge job little company or it's a scam artist more than likely than a scam artist because little bodge job companies generally put a bit more effort in so look very closely for that. And while we're talking about that, also look at the format of the email. Now, some scam emails, some phishing emails are very good at looking exactly like the original email, the proper email, but not always. So you need to look, the logo might be a slightly different size to usual. It might be in a different position. The font might be a bit bigger, a bit smaller, a different font even. Look for these little bits of detail. If it doesn't look, 100% genuine, if it's not what you're used to getting, then don't believe it. At that same point, what's it talking about? Would that company use the email you, email you about that situation? For example, quite a lot of times you'll get stuff from DVLA, and you'll think, well, actually, DVLA, the driving authority, license authority, tax and all that, they, they won't email you about things, they'll send you a letter unless you've asked them to email you. So ask yourself, why are they contacting me via email? Next up is the attachments. Is there any attachments? If you do not 100% trust it, do not click the attachment. Just don't. Most companies these days have a little portal on the website where you can go and get the attachments from. So there's no need to actually get it through the email anyway. Um, but if it's, I uh, gorgeous, I've been checking out your profile on Facebook and I write fancy, yeah? shall we meet up? Don't click that picture. An important thing to know that you won't know if you're not very computer literate is just because it says .jpg does not mean it's a picture document. But it's not that simple. So if you don't trust it, it doesn't matter what type of attachment it is, do not follow it. And that's also similar to the pictures in the email. If there's pictures that aren't loading right and there's a little link and it says click here to load the pictures, maybe it's a complete black document I mean, entire text is supposed to be within the images. Don't click it. Loading that image could then load a malicious code or send you to a malicious website. Do not click it. Do not refresh it. Unless you trust it, don't even interact with it. In fact, if it doesn't look right on the preview of the email, don't even open the email. Again, if it's causing urgency, no bailiff's going to email you and say it must be paid now. It must be paid today. No one's going to, no DVLA is going to say it needs to be paid today. If it's causing urgency, if it's that severe, they'll send you a letter, I'm sure. But if you do think, mm, is it causing urgency? Obviously, it has to be done now. That's trying to make you be panicked. It's trying to make you worry. It's trying to make you act impulsively. What are they trying to do? Ask yourself, what are they trying to do? Because they might just be wanting to get information at you. Information is very valuable. We are in the information age. And it always annoys me that people put their information all over Facebook and Twitter. But this is the information age. So if they want some information about you, that could be to share it to other scammers. It could be to build a profile on you. They might even be trying to steal your identity. Unlikely this type of attack. But it's possible. They might be able to use that information to get access into your bank account. Yeah, even your name, your address, your date of birth. All this information can be used against you. So do not give the scammers any information. Are they trying to click, make you click onto a link? That link, you don't even have to be redirected to a website for a link to be malicious. But if you're redirected to a malicious website, even if you don't click on anything on that website, it could have already been malicious still. Do not do anything that it wants you to do. Think about what it's trying to get you to do. So basically, all in all, just apply a little bit of logic. What's he trying to ask you to do? Does it look right? Does it seem right? And if you're not 100% sure, this is the next section, by the way, what to do if you're not 100% sure. If you're not 100% sure, don't do anything with it. Simple as. It's quite simple. If you've got an email from 
Gov, for example, or the council, or Netflix. Go directly to that website or phone them or email them, whatever. Don't respond to that email. Find their email out from a letter you've had in the past or from a Google search and contact them that way. If you do not know that, that email has come from where it says it's come from, don't respond to it, no nothing. This all works on a database scheme. So when somebody hacks into example.com, they'll then share that email and that password and any usernames, location names across the internet. They'll generally sell it. It's very rare that it just gets openly released. So when it's open released, Mr. Hacker can come forth and say, right, I've got all this information about this person, I'm going to leverage it. So they'll message you and say, look, we know you live in Rotherham, we know your name's Barry, and we, we know everything about you. We, we've hacked you, we've doomed you, or we are DVLA, we know this about you. They couldn't even know your car. I mean, it's quite easy to get that information if it's out there about you. And the chance are, if it's out there about you, it'll build up. The search of these databases with your name or with your email can very quickly build up, especially if you're a bit older. I mean, for example, me at my age, when I was younger, I was going on to game websites and everything. And these websites have been quite commonly hacked. So there'll be lots of data breaches out there. So if they've got little bits of information from each one, they've got quite a lot of information about me. So it's also quite important to change it up. So go back, So just to recap that little section, that is go directly to the source. Um, if it's a phone call, if you're on the phone and they're saying, I'll give you an example of this in a minute, but if you're on the phone and they're saying, oh, well, no, no, it's really important, blah, blah, blah. Don't give any information out, right? I, I had a massive argument with Netflix the other year. I think it was Netflix. Might be my bank. Or my phone company. I had an argument with someone on the phone because they phoned me and they wanted information from me to verify who I were. And I said, I'm not giving you any information about me. He said, ah, yeah, but we do need to verify who you are. And I said, I don't right care. You phoned me. I don't know who you are. You, you could be anyone. So what I did was hung up and I phoned back. And I said, I, uh, I didn't phone that number back. I went onto Google, found that number, and phoned them. I went to the official website, found the number, and phoned them. And then asked, I, I think you just phoned me. Oh, yeah, in body blah. Don't give information out. And as well, in them situations, people won't ask for your full password either. They'll ask for certain letters of your password, like your bank. What's your first, pass uh, first letter of your password? What's your fifth? What's your tenth? Blah, blah, blah. So bottom line is, if you're not 100% sure, do not interact with that email. Don't respond to it, no nothing. And again, responding to it, in them databases, you get spam calls, you get spam emails, spam texts. If you respond to that, it might just be wanting to know that is that account selected? Is that phone number selected? Is that email selected? Is someone using it? And by responding, all you're doing is updating the database and going, yeah, this gullible guy is still active. Let's, uh, let's attack him. Before we move on to the next section, I've got one more tip as well. A minute I've just, got, I've just told you that when I was a kid, I used to have to game websites and all these other things. And I, I now later have checked, uh, and these websites have been hacked. Now, one way you can find if your information is out there, there's quite a few different websites. But this one comes into particular mind, haveibeenporned.com. And what you do is type your email into there, and it'll tell you all the data breaches that your email address has come up in. It is a really good way to check every now and again, because then you know if you're more likely to get attacked or not. Just because the, your email doesn't come up here doesn't mean you won't get attacked, but it is a nice little step for you. And as well, if your email address does come up in any of the breaches, then you make sure you're not using any of the passwords that you're using them. Because if your name comes up, steve at example.com, password, password123, somebody can then go through Facebook, Netflix, email, and check that that password belongs to any of them websites because people do use the same website I have a password for everything so if you're one of them people make sure you're not using a password that you used in any of them breaches and i think i believe have i been pawned also gives you information on what password what information were leaked whether it was password bank information blah blah but the information i was leading up to then is don't use your real name to be fair people argue that you don't use your real name for pretty much anything but what I'd argue is if it's not financial, if it's not a serious thing, maybe it's a game website, a poker website, 
Poker websites, I think, need to know your customer information, so you have to load your password, so it might be slightly different. But if it's a game website, if it's an app that's just for fun, like a face changer, don't use a real name. And then that way, if that data is sold or stolen, and then you get an email saying, are you saying, Barry, you, you know it's not you straight off. So it doesn't matter what's in that email, you know it's not you. And as well as while you're looking at that kind of thing, you'll quite often get emails. If your email address is steve at example.com, you will get an email saying, hi, Steve. It's not because we know your name, it's because we've extracted it from the email. So for example, if yours is um, Steve, Steve's work at example.com, you know that they haven't really got your name because it'd come up saying, hi, Steve's work, we've got all your information. Well, no, you haven't because you don't even know my name. See, it's these little bits of information. So it's important never to give out information about yourself unless you have to. That is the best way to protect yourself. All right, so this email came in, this phone call came in, and you fell for it. You did as you were told. But as soon as you'd done it, you thought, damn, that was a mistake. What have I done? Don't panic. First of all, turn off the internet. Do not let that device connect, be connected to the internet. Uh, if it's possible, even turn off your router, just in case. It's a very sophisticated malware, which is very unlikely. Turn it off. Reason? One type of attack is it wants to put malware on your computer. Now, malware can do many different things these days, but it, it all depends on the malware. It might be a Bitcoin miner, for example. What these do is, if you've got a normal document producing laptop, it won't be able to produce much mine Bitcoin. It won't be able to mine much Bitcoin, so it's not going to generate much money. However, if you put that miner on a million laptops, them little bits are going to add up and you're going to earn a lot of money. So... First of all, what you want to do is disconnect your laptop and scan for malware. There's other types of malware. There might be information stealing malware, data stealing malware. And again, it's important you turn off your internet because what that malware might be doing is grabbing all the information as much as it can. If it's quite a slow malware, it's important to turn it off because it might not have sent it. It's connecting all this information and then it's going to send it back to the server. If your internet's disabled, your laptop can't connect to your internet, it can't send that information back to the evil hacker. So disconnect the internet. Second of all, you need to run malware. You should already have antivirus on your computer. So you won't need to run that. If you haven't got antivirus, you really ought to get some at this stage. Information security, hacks are going through the roof. If you go onto a dodgy website, if you fall for a phishing email, all these things can protect you. Mo Antivirus websites these days even detect these things for you, so you're less likely to get attacked by phishing. So it's important to have that, and it's not as expensive as it used to be. I've, I, I signed up to a new antivirus company this year, and I think it's cost me something stupid like £5 a month. So it, you get some, seriously do. Whatever you do, don't download any antivirus that says it's free. If it's free, you're the product, so in the best case scenario, it'll be harvesting information about you and selling it on. In the worst case scenario, it will be a virus within itself and it'll know that you haven't got any antivirus because you're downloading one and it'll just absolutely destroy your system. So try and get buy some antivirus if you can. Uh, maybe even free trials. I think uh, Malware Bytes, link here, still has a good um, free version and that is a genuine free version. If you do find any uh, free versions that you want to check out, again, just Google it. It's, well, don't Google it, use a search engine, type it up, look for reviews, and people generally tell you if it's a virus or not. Again, always when you're downloading things, do search it up. So you disconnect from the internet, you run the malware, it's clean, or maybe it found something, you can discard it. Now, you should do that no matter what the link got you to do, but you go to the link and it says, log in. Now this is where, where some, really, some really sophisticated malware will clone the website it's pretending to be. So for example, it'll look like PayPal, and it'll say, right, you need to log in and go and sort this problem out. The login form comes up, it looks identical, you type in your correct email, you type in your correct password, and then it refreshes and says, no, you've put the wrong password in. So then you do it again, and it logs in. Bang in, all's well, but there's no problem with the information center, resolution center, whatever PayPal call it. Huh, how strange. What you've just done is give your password away, because when you logged in and it said false, what actually happened then, in a brief second, it sent the password to a hacker and then it redirected you to the proper PayPal website. So the first one weren't really PayPal's website. 
and it redirected you to it after. So it looks like it, and it's a very convincing attack. So what do you do here? You've you said the password so it might not even be right, it might keep saying false, it might just shut down. It doesn't matter. If you clicked the malicious link and it's took your password, you need to then change your passwords. Now it gets a little bit more complicated here because we can steal your pass login details without you doing that. If you're logged into Netflix and there's a way for an attacker to steal your Netflix, it's not always possible. But if they steal your cookie, then they've got access to your um, Netflix account by using that cookie. So it gets a bit complicated there, but main thing you need to do is you need to look at the target. You need to then change that password. Now here's where you're gonna you're gonna probably start ignoring me here because people have been ignoring professionals for years. You shouldn't be using the same website for multiple same password for multiple websites. Don't do it. It's not good. Again, if your password comes up in one data breach with your email, they will then go through many different websites checking that email, checking that password, checking that email, checking that password. It's not good. Change that password. Don't use a weak password like password123 because there's another way people guess. So use a jumble up password, 5FG, hashtag, whatever. Now that's not easy to remember. So use a password manager. Again, antivirus these days comes with password managers. I think Kaspersky's got one. There's LastPass. There's quite a few different um, password managers out there. But what we do is you have one super password. So you need to create a really strong password for that. The longer the better, really. If you want to use a simple password, make sure you use a really long, simple password. So instead of just password123, password123, then password123 back, uh, backwards, and then your dog's name. It's just about a little bit harder. It's still not a secure password, but it is a lot more secure than just password123. And what that does is it stores all your passwords. So then when you want to log into email or something, it'll serve you your password. Now I've got a password manager on my laptop and on my phone. So all I have to do is if I lock, create a new account on my phone, it'll say, do you want me to save this password? I'll say, yes, please. And then on my laptop, when I log in later, it'll come up and go, oh, we've got the password fat for you. So it's even easier. You don't even have to log into things anymore. It does it for you. Bottom line is if you've been hacked, make, if you follow one of these links, make sure you change the password to whatever you've given that password away and make sure any other accounts for using that password get changed. Guys, seriously, I can't stress to you how much importance relies on strong and unique passwords. It's really not a gimmick to make money out of you. It is to make you safe, and that's why you're watching this video, so go and do it. The strong and unique passwords will keep you fail-safe anyway. Uh, another way you can be fail-safe is two-factor authentication. That is a little bit of an effort, but it is worth it. If someone's got your password to your PayPal account and your email, they can log in. Two-factor authentication makes that almost impossible because then they have to get access to whatever else it is. And if you use an app like uh, Google's Authenticator, but yet again, there's a few different versions out there, they have to then get access to that device, not just the code. They have to get access to that device. Your email address, that's good, but if somebody gets access to your email address, they can reset all the passwords, they can use your... Um, email for authentication so I would go towards the um, authenticator but you can use your phone as well again not as secure because sim card spoofing is a thing these days and it's quite easy to do um, but that's probably more secure than the email authentication the last thing to fail save yourself is back up your information if you use a if you've got a website or a server Make sure it's backed up. If it gets hyped, you can easily restore it. PCs, if there's anything valuable on your PC and you actually care about your PC, it should be backed up every day, every week, every month. Every month's better than none at all. Make sure it's backed up. Then if you get another malware that might come onto your computer is ransomware. Now ransomware, you might know this from when the NHS got hyped the other year. Basically, ransomware encrypts everything so you cannot access anything without the password that the hacker used. Once that's in, you have to pay the, the fee. Then they might or might not give you your password. Quite often they don't even give you your password, so you've you given away your money and you still can't get access. Now, if you've got a backup, it doesn't matter. You can rewrite everything and you've sorted them off. It's all good. So make sure you back up at least, at least once a month. If you've got important stuff on there, you might want to do it more frequently.
And that's it, we've got some uh, examples to go on forth. Uh, this video has been a lot longer than I expected it to be, so we're going to bounce on to the examples. Before we do, I want to tell you one about a phone call that a friend received recently. Um, so he came in and he's talking to me and he says, I've, I've had a terrible day. And I says, wow, what's up? He says, well, I had a phone call off DVLA. I said, all right. He says, oh, wait, where DVLA? It was HMRC, the uh, tax service in the UK. And he says, they, they told me I owed them two and a half thousand pound. And I says, oh. He says, wait a minute, you retired, aren't you? He says, yeah. I went, ah. He says, well, I, 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 I said that. And see, there you go. In straight away, he's got this phone call. They said you owe his money. He's panicked and he's gone, well, wait, I'm, wait, I'm retired. He's already given some information about himself away. So they said, no, no, it's an error from a couple of years ago. You owe us two and a half thousand pounds. It needs to be paid now. See, a bit of panic, a bit of urgency. It needs to be paid now. If not, we're going to shut your bank accounts down. We're going to start taking it out. We're going to send bailiffs around. Oh my God, we're panicked building now. Can you, can you, feel, can you imagine that? This guy's retired. He's not a young chap. The panic setting in. What do I do? Um, and he said, this guy on the phone was very professional. Anyway, 15 minutes into his phone call, he says, well, I ain't got any money. I've told you I have a pension. I ain't got any money. So I don't know what we're going to have to do about this. And at this point, the guy on the phone hung up, <laughs> which I find really cheeky. But, but see, there again, there was the urgency, there was a panic. Now, what should he have done in that moment? Okay, HMRC phoned you. Do you know what? I didn't expect to call off you ever. You usually email me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hang up, I'm going to Google the number, or get your phone call off a of paperwork I've received off you in the past and phone you back. Now, if that is a genuine phone call from HMRC, they're not going to say, whoa, stop it, don't do that, don't do that. They'll go, why? And you'll go, because I don't believe it's you. And they'll go, fair enough. They cannot do anything to you for that. They can't. There is nothing. They can't punish you for that. All you're doing is making sure you're safe. You are phoning them straight back, so it shouldn't really matter any which way. The more they don't want you to do that, the more you know it's not what it says it is. Second of all, you shouldn't get any information out, obviously. Um, but yet again, using that logic. He's been retired for four or five years. He, he should know that he doesn't owe any money to HMRC. And he said himself, looking back in hindsight, it was quite obvious. Well, hindsight is a bit too late when that urgency has kicked in, you've already sent that money. Because by the sounds of it, if he had that money, he would have sent it. Damn. Again, a little bit of bit logic. Think, is this liable? Is this possible? Why would this be happening? Why are they even phoning me? Why aren't they sending me a letter to sell my own money? This is how you bring us to work. It's easier said than done, but do not panic. Just think about it, stand back, look back at the situation and think, is everything right about this? And if it seems dodgy in the simplest way, don't. Like I said, in that situation, what you should have done is hang up the phone and phone back on a number that he trusts and recognise and says, I, I just had a call saying you owe me £2,500. You know, the chance that in that situation, he'd have gone, yeah, that weren't us, that was a scam call. Without even having to look up. Because HMRC would have gone, <laughs> we wouldn't have phoned you about that. We'd have e uh, emailed you or said, uh, wrote you a letter. Well, probably write a letter. So, again, just think, sit back out of the situation. If you're not happy with that email, close it. If you're not happy with that phone call, close it. You do not have to continue the dialogue. If you do not trust who's on the phone, if they're a trustable person, they should understand that you want to phone back for trust reasons. And even if, even if you're 100% convinced, it's, it's what it says it is. If they want information from you, if they want money from you, you phone them back to make sure you're giving it the right person. If you, if somebody turned up on your door tomorrow and said, I'm your account manager for your bank and you overdraw money £200 right now, you wouldn't give them £200. First one I want to show you is Uber. Now, this one is a brilliant one. <laughs> we all know that there's premium charge services when you're texting it charges a fortune. This one, I'm not quite sure if it's real or not. I had a very similar one, and it actually came up as Uber as the number, which, if, if, it, if it is not genuine, it's a very sophisticated attack. But what this basically is saying here is, your Uber code is this, press stop to unsubscribe. That is very quite clever, because what that's doing is going, oh, someone's trying to log in, or someone's trying to create an account in your name. Reply stop to... Stop getting these texts. Now, if there was a security problem, it would say, 
if you didn't ask for this, do this, or whatever else. They don't say that, it just says, take stop to unsubscribe. Which is very interesting, isn't it? If you just think about that for a second. Stop getting these codes to sign up. How bizarre. So you, you're not going to click that, surely. You're not, you're not going to reply stop. You're just going to leave it be. Block the number if so, if it's annoying you that much. But don't fall for it. Now we've got one more off Uber here. And this goes more on to what I said a minute ago. Ah, yeah. Your Uber trip with Imran has been booked for 217 great British pounds. If you did not book this trip, please click below. Well, it's a lot of money. Where's it going? It's a long distance, that 217 quid. Again, we've got the Uber, Uber name up here. It looks very genuine. We can't see what the Earl were, which would be quite interesting. I imagine it'll be a short and down Earl, so you couldn't tell what it were either which way. But but I'm not convinced. It's a, it's a lot of money. Now, as I mentioned earlier, what's it asking you to do? It's asking you to click a link to cancel an order. Now, if you don't use Uber, like I don't, you. I don't know if it's genuine or not. I've, I've never used Uber before. Do you get them texts? Also, ask yourself, do you use Uber? Because if you don't use Uber and you get a text like this, well, it's not your bank account they're using and your phone. Yeah, you know I mean, it's not your account they're using. Don't worry about it. Again, if you do use Uber, don't click the link. What we're going to do, we're going to go direct to Uber. We're going to look at trips booked. Now everything seems fine on Uber. Let's go to his bank account. We'll have a look at his bank account. Now nah, everything seems fine on his bank account. We're doing all right then, aren't we? Just think about it. Just have a look. Here we go. PayPal's emailed us. They want a response. We emailed you a little while ago to ask your help resolving the issue of your PayPal account. Your PayPal account is temporarily limited because we haven't heard from you. We noticed some unusual activity. Now, here, they're creating a little bit of panic. They're not pushing it too much. They've temporarily limited your PayPal account. If you use PayPal a lot, that might be a bit of a panic concern for you. But they've noticed some unusual activity. Now, that's worrying. Someone's just stole some money off you. So they're not directly pushing it. They're asking for it. It does look very e uh, PayPal formatted. Very well done uh, to whoever made this. Unfortunately, if we look at top... We can see the email address. Now, this is where it becomes important. We've got service at intel.paypal.com, which is PayPal's actual email address that they'd email you from. But that's not the actual email. If we look at the email just at the side of it, it's at service epaypal at Outlook. PayPal's a big company. They're not going to be using Outlook.com. Would be using paypal.com. So again, this is quite obviously a scam. The, the, the sent from not PayPal. And what do we want us to do? We want us to click the link to log in. We want us to click the resolution center. You're going to click either of them and it'll take you to a login page to you to put your details in on a website that will look like PayPal but won't be PayPal. Um, so, so it's not a very good idea to be clicking them links. Again, what should you do? PayPal.com. Go check it out. Go to the Resolution Center through PayPal. See if there is an issue somewhere. And I guarantee you that it isn't. So this is the last one. And I didn't tell you in the video about this, but I meant to. Um, because it is a very well put together little thing. I and somebody I know got a very similar phishing email. But... The difference, it, it was formatted a little bit differently. The, the main bulk still there. So, I do know password is your password. Uh, you don't know me, and you're probably thinking, why are you getting this email? Well, basically, I put some virus on your computer while you're watching porn. I've took all your desktop by RDP. A bit, a bit of technicality here to make you think it's real. They've basically 
remote access to your computer, put a keylogger on it, been watching your cam, they've nicked all your contacts on Facebook Messenger and your email, and they've basically got a video of you fapping and uh, recorded the porn at the same time, put both together, and we're going to send them to your friends. Uh, if you send them two thousand dollars, well, they'll they'll not send it, and they'll give you uh, peace of mind of deleting it. Two problems here: if you were that person and you were as wicked and fucked up as they are, would you delete that porn? I don't think you would, would you? You'd keep it and you'd blackmail them again. So sending that money is not going to help. The person that I know that received this said, "Well, I don't watch porn." <laughs> My actual response was, "What? Who don't watch porn?" <laughs> but my, my actual response to him were uh, well what are you worried for me? if you don't watch porn you don't need to be worried about someone that's been watching you watch porn do you because you haven't been watching porn so it's obviously a lie if you do watch porn then this is a very very scary email to receive um, but it can assure you that it gives you a lot more information about you I think the email I received said that they know a lot about me but didn't actually tell me anything about me apart from a password. Again, they might know your name. They obviously know your email. They've got your password. It, it, it's, it's a very hard thing to tell. But I guarantee anyone that's been keylogging on your computer, got remote access to your computer, they won't be writing you an email asking you for £2,000. They take £2,000 off you. Uh, or they won't bother because they know you couldn't afford it. I mean, from what it sounds like here, they've been able to see everything they've done on the computer. So they'll be able to look at bank details, they'll be able to look at emails, they'll be able to look at everything. And all it is, is a fear tactic. They probably haven't even wrote this email themselves. It's a generic email that's gone out to every single password email connection and told them all that they know the details. Again, this one's a scary one. Don't respond. Don't pay anything. The best thing you can do with this type, if it's convincing and there's not really, they're not claiming to be a company, they're claiming to be an hacker, the best thing you can do is Google the main gist of email. Email claiming to have been watching me watch porn. Search that in your search engine and other people that have got the same email will come up telling you that they've got it. It's very unlikely that you're going to be bribed by a hacker. It, it, it really is. Um, as, as we topped over at the beginning of the video, the vast, vast majority of, ha of hacks come from phishing emails. So chances are, if you're about to be hacked, it's because you received one of these emails and you hadn't responded accordingly. That's it. Thanks for watching.